Uh, I'm Jim Fishkin. I'm at Stanford, and I have a Center for Deliberative Democracy. Our, the issue I want to talk to about is how to consult the public in a representative and thoughtful way. Uh, there's a, a problem. If you, well, you could have innovation, you could have governance without bringing in the public at all. You'd have technocrats, experts, et cetera, et cetera. The public's very suspicious of experts, technocrats, politicians. So you want to bring in the public. How do you bring in the public? If you bring in the public just with self-selected crowdsourcing, you may turn up interesting ideas, but if you try to aggregate that to get a sense of the public will, you have a big problem, which you see illustrated all over the world and with the, the sort of comedy of the current administrations with people uh, with the massive online voting for um, uh, a Death Star or uh, the NRA mobilizing to get uh, Pierce Morgan deported and you know, various things. So, so, so because on the self-selected online consultation is open to capture. Uh, uh, so you could do polls, but the public often isn't very much aware of the issues. Uh, the reason for that, I mean, it's well known, uh, rational ignorance. If I have one vote in millions, why should I think about the complexities of public issues? My individual voice, my individual opinion won't have much effect, as Anthony Downs uh, hypothesized years ago. And even if you ask uh, the, the people in polls um, about complicated issues, they may not have an opinion, but they will offer an answer. Phantom opinions or non-attitudes, as Phil Converse uh, uh, coined them, um, like the Public Affairs, of Public Affairs Act of 1975, which George Bishop studied, there was, and they, they were, there was no Public Affairs Act of 1975, but the public was quite willing to, they didn't want to admit they don't know, so they'd offered opinions. Washington Post celebrated the 20th anniversary of the non-existent Public Affairs Act of 1975 by asking people about its repeal uh, and say, saying whether Clinton wanted to repeal it or the Republicans in Congress wanted to repeal it, and they got answers to that too, but there was no Public Affairs Act of 1975. Uh, and then the third problem is even when people do think and talk about politics or policy, they talk to people like themselves, and they go to just the websites that they tend to agree with. There's a lot of ex selective exposure, and so people are not thinking about the competing views. So what's the solution? There's actually a very simple half remedy. That half remedy is, well, I have a name for it. I call it deliberative polling. Uh, and we do this all over. I'll, I'll just explain it. I, you can't read that. Yeah, we've done it in 18 countries about 70 times. I'm just off the plane from Africa, where with USAID money, we're now going to spread it at the local level in Africa. Uh, uh, there we did it, that can be transnational, that's the entire European, that's a sample of the entire European Union in the Parliament building of the European Union. We did that in 22 languages, well actually 21 because the Irish wanted to speak English but we were prepared. Uh, uh, it, it, um, uh, I thought I invented the idea of a deliberating microcosm chosen by lottery. See, a random sample creates a microcosm. If it's a good random sample, creates a microcosm of the population, all its viewpoints, concerns, and it can deliberate, and you break it up into small groups so that it's dialogue on a human scale. And it turns out I've got colleagues who make a good living demonstrating how stupid the public is. In fact, the public is potentially very smart. You just have to create social conditions and a design where they have a reason to pay attention and you make it easy for them to engage in with good information and competing arguments. Then they are consistently brilliant. Well, I thought I invented it, but it goes back to ancient Athens. That's a, um, a, a photo I snapped in the Museum of the Forum of the Claritarian, which is the machine, or what's left of the machine by which the Athenians used, select, used created a random sample for the Council of 500, a random sample of their citizenry which created the agenda for, let's, oh, I've only got 24 seconds? Oh. Uh, 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 well, we return it to Adam. <laughs> uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, anyway, we do this in various parts of the world. Turns out that that's the way to get the informed and representative views of the public. And uh, with uh, my son Bobby Fishkin there, there's, we have a little technology company, or he has a little technology company 
uh, called Reframe It, where we engage in ways of opening up the discussion with a certain kind of responsible crowdsourcing with the, with the deliberating random sample who rate the comments from the public and, and revisit the options so that we, it's the only method in the world, and it won this prize from McKinsey and the Harvard Business Review, it's the only method in the world that allows data that is representative and informed of any size population while at the same time providing input from the entire population that is that can't be um, can't be captured by mobilization like the Pierce Morgan or uh, or a story. So anyway, happy to engage in a broader.